Cheers everybody, my name is Dane, Dane Reads, this is a different intro style, and today I am going to be doing my top reads of 2021. It's currently New Year's Eve, it's 10 past 10 on New Year's Eve, I'm having a wild time all by myself. Um, mm. So if you hear fireworks, that's why. Let's dive straight on in. I'm not going to do the numbers because I always lose count, so we'll just do those in the editing and uh, we'll be alright. So, Dane Reads. We have Volta by Nikki Dudley. So this is a crime novel. Um, Nikki went to my uni, I think she was a year above me. Um, she's also the editor of Street Cake magazine, which has published my poetry a few times in the past. And um, I was supposed to read and review this as part of the blog tour, which was being carried out by Isabel Kenyon of Fly on the Wall Poetry Press. Um, but because she reached out to me and I was like, oh, well, I know Nikki, um, I decided I'd get the book for myself which I did eventually do and did eventually read it. It just took me a little while. And yeah, it was a cracking little crime novel. Um, it kind of subverts a lot of the tropes that are overdone in crime, I think. And so for that alone, it's, it's kind of worth reading. Then we have The Others by James Herbert. So I vaguely remember this one. I think this was the one where there was like a, a nursing home in it or a children's home or something like that. Um, more, it's more so that I can remember the way that it made me feel. And we will get this a lot with this list because obviously some of these I read back in January, so it's hard to remember the details but um, I do remember very much enjoying it. At the time, I think I'd read four or five James Herberts and it was just about in my top three. Then we have The Honorary Consul by Graham Greene. Again, another one that I don't particularly remember. Uh, Graham Greene is one of my favorite authors though. Um, so I think this is pretty kind of average for one of his books. It's just that his books are that good that they always tend to rank highly in my lists. And um, yeah, definitely one to check out. I think it was, actually I seem to remember, it was to do with the kidnapping plot in, um, I want to say in Latin America somewhere, and there was like the British consul, the American consul, and uh, another one, and they kidnapped the wrong one. Then we have On a Distant Ridgeline by Sam Rees. So this is a short story collection, very beautifully written. Um, like It's almost like poetic in the language it uses. Uh, this is one that was sent to me by Fly on the Wall Poetry Press. They've been doing some really good short story collections recently. Um, and I think I said in my original review of this, this is one of those books that reminds you of the value of short story collections and is a... Uh, you know, a good reason why publishers should still be publishing short fiction, even though it's not necessarily the most commercial type of fiction. Then we have 21 Lessons for the 21st Century by Yuval Noah Harari. So Harari, I guess, is like a thought leader and futurist. He's a gay Israeli, which is always pretty cool. I think he's Jewish. Um, and uh, yeah, this is like a non-fiction book. Now, the only issue with it is that as opposed to it being 21 lessons, it's more like 21 essays. And it doesn't really feel as though there's like a cohesive narrative holding it all together. It's just these 21 different things he felt like writing about all shoved together in a single book. But um, it is still very enjoyable, very insightful, and one of those books that's going to make you think a lot. Then we have Asterix Legal by Argosini and Eoderzo. So this is the first of the Asterix graphic novels, uh, Bon Dessine in uh, French. And yeah, I've been reading about 10, or, I'm on about 10 or 11 now. I've been reading my way through the whole series a little bit at a time, uh, reading it through in the original French as a way to improve my French vocabulary. And uh, as you can tell from it being on this list, I did really enjoy it. Now, the only thing is, is after you've read a half a dozen or so of them, they do all start to kind of blur together, you know? Uh, they have their like their self-contained plots and whatnot. It's just that quite often the plots are fairly similar. Then we have Later by Stephen King. So this is a book about uh, basically this little kid can see people after they're dead. Um, and there's a little bit of a mystery involved. It's kind of a departure of the normal stuff that he writes about, but uh, I did enjoy it. It's one of his more recent ones. Um, I think was it published as Hard Case Crime? I can't remember, but um, yeah, definitely, definitely one that's worth reading. Then we have Clothes, 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 Music, 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 Boys, Boys, Boys by Viv Albertine. So Viv Albertine was the guitarist in The Slits. Um, she dated, I want to say his name was Mick Jones from The Clash. Um, had a thing with like uh, Sid Vicious and all this kind of stuff. And she was just around in like the early days of punk and it's kind of her memoir. Both of those kind of her younger days and then sort of her older days as well and she sort of you know goes into what happens after the punk era is over and she's like 50 odd now or whatever um, and still doing her thing still being creative and so you know I think it's very cool she's like it was an interesting read and she just seems like a really interesting person I'd like to go for a beer with her which reminds me A Decent Ride by Irvin Welsh um, which is very unsafe for work uh, very Irvin Welsh it's actually kind of more comedic than his usual stuff. There is still a lot of dark stuff in there and a lot of Scottish swearing and drug use and all of this stuff. Um, but also, um, again, as I say, it's more comedic. Hurricane Ball Bag is blowing him. 
just it was a lot of fun. Then we have Shakespeare by Bill Bryson. So this is basically a biography of Shakespeare, even though Bryson acknowledges in the book, he's like, well, we don't actually know that much about Shakespeare. So he's kind of included what he can in there. Because of that, it's only about 200 pages, which makes it super easy to read as well. Very interesting if you're a, a Shakespeare fan or a Bryson fan. And um, yeah, it was just super readable as well, because I can imagine it would be very easy to write a very like dull, dry book about Shakespeare. But Bryson managed to get the balance right and to make it interesting. Then we have Letters from a Stoic by Seneca. So Seneca was a, a Stoic philosopher. These letters, they were, from what I understand, sent out as real letters to people, but I think he had half an eye on them being published for posterity as well. Um, he shares a lot of his life advice and stuff. Now, interestingly, some of his advice is like, oh yeah, don't just listen to what uh, philosophers do and copy their words, like make your own mind up. But it's like, well, yeah, you're saying that, but then you're writing this anyway. <laughs> But yeah, it was, um, it was really readable actually. So again, I think with, um, l with letter collections, for me they're like classic bedtime reads in that they're not the kind of book I'd normally just sit down and read as my main book because I'd get too bored. But with this one, I was able to sort of stick at it and read it as, as my main book. So that says a lot about it. Then we have The Secret of Crickley Hall by James Herbert. So this is pretty much like the archetypal ghost story. Um, in fact, reading it, I can see how a lot of other ghost stories have been influenced by it. I can also see how it's been influenced by what came before in terms of things like, um, you know, The Haunting of Hill House by Shirley Jackson and things like that. Quite a long old read, but it was very absorbing. There's also a nice bit of backstory to it. Um, there were a few moments to it where I was not so convinced because I don't think it managed to make me suspend my disbelief as much as it kind of needed to for the story to work. But as I say, overall, pretty good read, would recommend. Then we have Baptism of Fire by Andrzej Szymkowski. So this is one of the Witcher books. I can't remember which Witcher book it was. No pun intended there. Um, or really what the plot was, because by this point I've read the whole series. Um, but it was just one of the ones that stood out to me from that series as being one of the better ones. Then we have Illuminated Poems by Allen Ginsberg. So this one is, I said in my original review of this, it's almost a bit of a misnomer because it should really be called Illustrated Poems because that's what it is. It's a bunch of Allen Ginsberg's poetry illustrated with some really cool artwork that's like so good that you'd want to hang the artwork on your wall, you know? So um, there's, what's, what's not to like? You've got Allen Ginsberg's poems and you've got some really cool art on it. Good stuff. Then we have The Truth by Peter James. So this is interesting because it's like, I guess, a mixture between like a psychological thriller, a regular thriller, like even little bits of supernatural thrown in there. Um, and it basically centers around this couple who've bought a house, but they're a bit skint and they make a deal for the wife to be uh, the surrogate mother of um, this very strange rich man. That's all I'm going to tell you about that one. Then we have Bazaar of Bad Dreams by Stephen King. So this is one of his more recent short story collections. I love uh, King's short stories because to, for a start, they're hardly short stories. Like some of them are verging on novellas. So you really get to get stuck into them, you know? Um, but there were just some really cool stories in this one. Uh, the one that stands out to me was the one about this Kindle that kind of allows you to see the books that writers would have made if they'd lived longer and in different universes and all that kind of stuff. So very cool. Then we have The Plague by Albert Camus. So I've been on a bit of a Camus hype this year and read quite a lot of his books. Um, the Plague was up there as one of my favorites of them, in part because of the time in which I read it. So obviously it's in the middle of the coronavirus pandemic. So it was interesting to see kind of what he got right about that and how he predicted people would react and stuff. But also it reads much more as a novel as opposed to some of his other books where it's like almost a hybrid of fiction and non-fiction. This one was much more like flat out fiction. So that was pretty cool. Then we have House Atreides by Brian Herbert and Kevin J. Anderson. So this is a bit of a surprise for me because basically I've always heard that the, the Brian Herbert and Kevin J. Anderson Dune books weren't particularly good. And so far I've read two of them um, that they worked on together and I've possibly enjoyed them more than the original Dune books. Um, so I'm excited to kind of keep going with them. And yeah, House of Trades it's like a prequel. It's the first book in a prequel trilogy. Um, and even though it's called House of Trades, it doesn't just focus on the Atreides. We get uh, the Harkonnens and, you know, everybody else. Get to see what, what like, the setup was for the first Dune book, which I think is quite cool. Then we have The Fall by Albert Camus. Um, again, another one of Camus' books. This one is one much, much more leaning towards non-fiction. Um, but this was one of the ones that... 
I got so en engrossed in this book, I was meant to be tabbing it out and I just completely forgot because I was just enjoying reading it so much. Um, there's a lot of like food for thought again, a lot of these like philosophical concepts wrapped up in a way that makes it easy for you as a like lay person or whatever to understand them, which I think is cool. And uh, yeah, I believe, in fact, yes, it's the highest ranking Albert Camus book in this list. Then we have A Slip of the Keyboard by Terry Pratchett. So these are, I want to say, were they collected essays? They were either collected essays or collected short stories. Now I'm a huge Discworld fan and uh, I've kind of made it my mission to read everything that Pratchett ever wrote and so I'm just ticking off the last few books here. And you know because I'm such a Pratchett fan that I'm going to enjoy anything he writes and The Slip of the Keyboard is no different. I'm actually going to get a Death of Rats tattoo on the back of my arm there. I'm booked in early next week for that. So that's very exciting. And um, yeah, just beautifully written as well. Then we have Oceans of Venus by Isaac Asimov. So this is one of the Lucky Star novels, which are kind of like space detective novels. Uh, he wrote them under the, the pseudonym of Paul French, um, but I think they hold up as well as anything that Asimov did under his own name. And what's interesting about this one as well is that he says in the introduction to it, like when he wrote it, it was believed that there might have been water on Venus, but by the time he got to this reissue of it or whatever, we, we knew that there was no chance, there was no water on Venus. So Oceans of Venus doesn't actually really work as a concept, but again, if you can suspend your disbelief, you're going to enjoy it. Then we have How Sarconan by Brian Herbert and Kevin J. Anderson. So this is the second of those Dune prequels. As you can tell, I enjoyed it more than the first. I don't know if that's just because by this point I'm like pretty well into it, you know, and I'm engrossed and, and keen to find out what happens next. But yeah, did very much enjoy it and um, would recommend checking it out. I also did a full review. In fact, I'll link below to the full reviews I did of any of these books that I mentioned. Then we have The Rest of the Robots by Isaac Asimov. So this is basically just a collection bringing together his unpublished published robot short stories. Um, I, Robot by Isaac Asimov is my favourite short story collection of all time and so it's no surprise that any collection of his that brings robots together, I'm going to enjoy it and I think you will as well. Then we have The Stars and Their Courses by Isaac Asimov. Can't really remember this one I'm afraid. As Asimov is another one of those authors that I read a lot of books by and this is kind of why I keep this list as I go throughout the year and then uh, every quarter when I do my favourite books I just add the 10 favourites roughly into whereabouts I think they fit in this order because I must have really enjoyed it when I read it, I just don't remember it. Maybe it's time for a reread. Um, but yeah, I'd miss out on a lot of books like that if I was to just compile this at the end of the year. Then we have The Secret of Cold Hill by Peter James. So this is the sequel to The House on Cold Hill. It's very much a ghost story in the vein of The Secret of Crickley Hall, even you know down to the name is pretty similar. Um, but I think I enjoyed this one more, partly because it's a more modern ghost story. It's very brutal. I mean, he's got to be influenced by James Herbert. Like some of the the scenes that he wrote in this are very much like reminiscent of like the gore scenes that James Herbert's really good at. Um, and yeah, there was like a pretty pretty horrible incident that happened to someone on a construction site and various other bits and bobs. Just at the end of the day, it's a badass ghost story set in the first 21st century. Then we have East is East by Ayub Khan Din. So this is a play. Uh, it has been turned into a movie, which I gave a rewatch to because I've watched the movie years ago. There's also a sequel called West is West, which I actually think is better than East is East. Um, but as far as I know, that's not been done as a play. Uh, and when it came out, I mean, East is East did really well and won a load of plaudits and all of this stuff. It does a great job of showing what it is to be like a British Muslim. Uh, the family lives in Bradford, I want to say. Um, and it's also a mixed race family with like an English wife and a Muslim uh, father. I'm not sure where from, I guess Pakistan, but I'm not entirely sure on that one. Um, and it just does a really good job of kind of showing this family dynamic and some of the you know grievances that they have. Up next we have Corrings by Stephen Colgan. So this is the third book in his series that he's written, which is like kind of quirky, cozy mysteries. They remind me a lot of my series, actually, the Lightfold series. Um, but Colgan's books, I guess, are more humorous and less on the crime, although they do have elements of crime as well. In this one, a geriatric circus comes to town and uh, there's a bit of a scheme going where this guy who's like landed gentry or whatever, he tries to get his sister to marry. And uh, yeah, it's just a lot of fun, very funny, do recommend. Then we have Unbury Carol by Josh Malaman. So um, I didn't particularly like Bird Box when I read that, but I really did enjoy Unbury Carol. I thought it was very well written, and um, it's one of those books that kind of keeps you guessing throughout the end. There's a lot of tension there as well. The main character, Carol, she like d suffers from this disease where 
she kind of falls asleep and it's you know you can't distinguish whether she's asleep or dead and because of that um, her husband hatches a plan to get rid of her so hence unbury Carol then we have the Moonstone by Wilkie Collins so I read this with Charles Charlie Heathcote and um, yeah this was um, like it's hailed quite often as being the first detective novel now I don't know if it's actually the first because in the book Collins talks about one of the characters reading detective novels, which is kind of weird if this is the first one. Um, but yeah, really well done. Um, a lot of it is based on the uh, the case at Roadhill House, which is uh, the case that Mr. Witcher dealt with, Jack Witcher from the, uh, the, the whatever it is, the, what is it? The Suspicions of Mr. Witcher, that's the one. Um, but yeah, it's just a very influential crime novel, sort of very readable as well, just really enjoyed it. Then we have The Dark by James Herbert. So Herbert is just really good at writing these horror novels that take something that everybody or that a lot of people are afraid of and then turning it into horror. So in this case, he takes on The Dark. Basically, people who get exposed to The Dark go mad and start attacking each other and stuff. And um, I mean, one of the things I particularly liked about this, one of the characters was talking about how in... Um, in, during the war, during the Blitz, they had to like cover all the windows to stop any light from getting out and had to like sit in the darkness and stuff and now it's kind of the opposite, they're not allowed to go into the darkness. Very good read, very quick read as well, so just one to read if you're into horror. Then we have The Fog by James Herbert, so this is probably my second favourite Herbert novel after The Rats and uh, for me it's particularly memorable about, for a scene that happens in Bournemouth where basically the entire town just walks in the sea and commits mass suicide. Kind of similar concept to The Dark except this time it's fog, so if you get exposed to this fog, strange things happen, don't go near the fog. Then we have The Crucible by Arthur Miller. So this is a play based on the Salem Witch Trials. My edition was super interesting because Miller had also included notes on it um, in terms of like the different characters and stuff because obviously this happened many years ago and there aren't really records still lying around. So he talked about what he did know and then what he had to make up. So some of the like, you know, he'd know a certain person existed but he wouldn't know what their character was like so he had to make that up. Um, overall, just a really engaging play um, and some great books, uh, great, great quotes and stuff. It. There was a line in it where someone was saying these books are heavy and they were saying it's because of the weight of knowledge combined contained within them So yeah, definitely a cracking play and one I'd love to go and see performed Then we have The Last Keeper by J.V. Hilliard So this one actually isn't officially released until early 2021 It's probably out at the time you're, you're watching this video uh, He's a client of mine, so full disclosure I worked with him on the edits for this um, But it's a fantasy novel and he's been playing Dungeons and Dragons for like 30 odd years and basically for this book, he took the land he'd created for D&D &D and made it into a book. So he'd already got all of the world building kind of covered, like so many characters, like really, um, really good, like, you know, bestiary to it and great politics and all of that stuff. It's not quite epic fantasy. It's kind of a mixture between epic fantasy and like YA fantasy, I guess. Um, but really, really well done. One of the best fantasy novels I've, I've read recently. And I'm not just saying that because I edited it. Then we have Lost at Sea by John Ronson. So these were basically a collection of different essays where he goes off on these different adventures. So um, he goes behind the scenes at Deal or No Deal, which is a TV show. He goes, uh, he goes to a UFO uh, convention with Robbie Williams. Um, what else? He did all kinds of crazy stuff, basically. He went on the streets with those like people who dress up as superheroes and act as vigilantes. Um, so there was lots of really cool stuff to this one. It was just a very, as I say, very engaging read. Um, and definitely one I'd recommend. Probably my favourite John Ronson book. So then we have I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings by Maya Angelou. So this is autobiographical about her childhood. Some really like horrible stuff went down. So trigger warnings for a lot of stuff, including like child abuse and rape and all of this kind of stuff. But again, it's just really well written. You can tell that she was a poet by the language that she used in her autobiography. Probably one of the best autobiographies I've ever read. And there's a reason why it's sort of so well known and so widely celebrated. And number four, we have Something Happened by Joseph Heller. So my friend Dave told me that the joke is that nothing actually happens in Something Happened. I disagree, but I can see what he means. There was like a lot of... It's one of those where the plot comes second to the characters and like the philosophizing in it. Um, but... I mean, I just think it has a lot to offer us because it basically follows like a guy in a bit of a, not a dead end job, he's working in an office and he's got a lot of responsibility, but it kind of covers all those office politics and stuff and then his weird relationship with his family and whatnot as well. Overall, as I say, just one that I would definitely recommend. I, I like, really enjoyed reading it. Then we have Cart on a Hot Tin Roof by Tennessee Williams. So this is another play. And um, I mean, the only thing about this one is that 
I imagined all the characters in my head, they were all black, and then I saw the, this film and they, they were not black. Um, not that I suppose that matters, because it's a play, so you can, you know, it doesn't matter. Um, there's a guy in it, it's basically a kind of a family drama, there's a guy in it called Brick, who has terminal cancer, but his family don't really want to tell him that. Um, and it just kind of covers a lot of the different relationships, you know, throughout the family. And number two, we have Steppenwolf by Herman Hesse. So I can't remember much of the specifics of this book, other than that I remember the way it made me feel, and I remember saying it reminded me of Catcher in the Rye, but for like disillusioned 30 to 40 somethings. In fact, Steppenwolf is probably out of all of these the one that I want to reread the most, and I will probably listen to an audiobook of it next year. Very beautifully written. It's hard to tell how much of that is due to the translator and how much of that is due to the author, but um, again, it's made it onto this list, so you know it's a good one. And finally, at number one, we have The Queen's Gambit by Walter Tevis. So, like a lot of people, I enjoyed the Netflix show. And I wanted to pick up the book to see what it was about. And it just really didn't disappoint. It was just the right length for the story it held. Um, it was very close. Like, the, the Netflix guys did a really good job of uh, adapting it as well. Because it was very close to the original. Um, and I think they were both as good as each other. I mean, The Queen's Gambit would probably be if not top, very near to the top of my top watched shows this year. So um, yeah, definitely watch it and read the book. If you can, read the book first, but obviously I didn't and it did no harm because it was still my favourite book of the year. So there we have it. Those are my top 40 books of 2021. As always, thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Let me know in the comments if you've read any of these books and if so, what you thought of them. Hit that subscribe button for more and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Happy 2022. Happy New Year, everybody. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.